Coming up on Living St. Louis, a trip back to the summer of 1943 and a patriotic stunt that turned out to be a terrible idea. And I still remember it to this day. A new kind of trial at the old courthouse. The defendant branded a public enemy. This is just a plant. How is it going to defend itself? It was 1950. St. Louis had a plan for the riverfront and wanted Harry Truman to give it a boost. Fast forward to this year. Big changes, two ribbon cutters, and what Eero Saarinen's daughter thinks about all of this. And a story about changing channels, easily done at home with a remote, but a TV station channel change takes the job to a whole new level. It's all next on Living St. Louis. This Emmy Award-winning program wouldn't be possible without your support. Thank you to the members of Channel 9. You make it possible. I'm Jim Kircher, and we're going to be, well, kind of all over the place tonight. From here on the arch grounds to a laboratory to a thousand feet up our station antenna. And we're going to travel back in time. We're going to start off with a story about a Sunday afternoon in St. Louis in the summer of 1943. It has to be well, one of the worst days, one of the biggest disasters in the city's history. It was in the middle of World War II, but it didn't happen in Europe or in the South Pacific. It happened right here on the home front. It happened on August 1st of 1943, 75 years ago, in front of thousands of people at Lambert Airport, a crash that took the lives of some of the city and county's most prominent civic leaders. Over the years, I've heard the story from three people who were there. One was a photographer, the late Jack Zert, who took a lot of great pictures in his lifetime, but not another one like this. For years, I'm the guy that made the picture of the plane crash. The other two who saw it happen, they were just kids. It was a Sunday, a warm, sunny day. It was during the war. It was uh, sort of like a promotion for selling war bonds. St. Louis's Robertson Aircraft was making gliders here for the war. These films of the gliders were shot later in action. They were throwaway aircraft, used once to get men and equipment behind enemy lines and then abandoned. They would earn a reputation for unpredictability, especially on landings. That day in 1943, it was a chance for St. Louisans to see one of their community's contributions to the war effort. And I was standing on the steps of the administration building facing east. I was sitting on my dad's uh, shoulders. And the tower made an announcement that the glider was to be um, boarded. And uh, they had the mayor of St. Louis and a whole lot of dignitaries were going to take a glider ride. And the glider was made right there in St. Louis. Mayor William D. Becker led a group of distinguished passengers for this demonstration flight, leaders of local government and industry. The routine photo assignment was given to Cub photographer Jack Zert. We did a number of close-up pictures and uh, uh, a few things like that. And then we even went inside the plane and made pictures of the, uh, the passengers seated on either side of the aisle. And uh, we even asked if we could go up with them. Thought it'd be interesting shooting their expressions and things like that. But they wouldn't allow us to take cameras, so who needed that? So we didn't go. Jack Zert wasn't the only one who didn't get on board. The mayor's wife, Louise Becker, was invited and was looking forward to her first glider trip, but was disappointed when told at the last minute that having women on board was against military rules. The glider had already made one demonstration flight that day, and it was once again tethered to the tow plane. After takeoff, the cable would be released and the engineless craft would be piloted down to land in front of the crowd. A day before the flight, reporters had asked Mayor Becker about the possible hazards. He said he didn't think it would be dangerous, and then jokingly said, when our time comes to die, there isn't much we can do about it. As for the wisdom 
of putting so many important people on the same glider? He said if our boys are asked to use these things, why shouldn't we? It took off and uh, flew quite a distance around. Flew overhead real low with the glider behind it. And I made pictures of it flying across. And it got up a little higher and the glider released. And the glider was on its own. And almost instantly, one of the wings moved up into a 45 degree angle. The first thing I thought, and I've heard this mentioned several times in tragic episodes from the past, I thought it was part of the act. And the wing broke off and it just nosed yeah. right over and right into the ground. So I decided to, uh, to keep it in my finder and track it till just before it hit the ground. Well, it started to spiral. And I wasn't thinking about the poor people inside. I was thinking about making a photograph. Uh, my heart was in my mouth as the wing turned and pointed directly at me. And I said to myself, well, that's no picture. Uh, I got to get it all the way around before it hits the ground. Well, it did make one more spiral. And that's when I shot. And then, bang, it was on the ground. Might have been a sound similar to an explosion. I still remember it to this day. A glider hitting the ground straight down and the wing fluttering down after it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the tower said that um, there's nothing else we can do here, please go home. And people, I think, were in state of shock for the most part and um, began to file out. It was discovered that a metal piece connecting the wing strut to the glider had been machined by a subcontractor much, much too thin, and the parts had gotten by quality control inspectors. Two inspectors resigned and there were lawsuits. And while a grand jury denounced the manufacturing and the lack of inspection, it said that while there had been a shirking of moral obligations, there was nothing that could be prosecuted. There's a plaque in City Hall with the names of the pilots and the passengers. Mayor Becker, the county's presiding judge, the president of the Chamber of Commerce, and William Robertson, the head of Robertson Aircraft and a St. Louis aviation pioneer. This tragedy would become a footnote in the home front story of a world war. But there were those who said the loss of so many prominent civilians brought needed attention to a problem that if it hadn't been fixed, may well have cost more lives on the battlefields of Europe. Nearly 4,000 glider troops took part in the Normandy invasion. It's been almost 90 years since the old courthouse in downtown St. Louis heard its last case. Now, I'm not sure what the case was or its significance, but these courts have heard a man sue for his freedom, a woman sue for her right to vote, and recently in this building's first case in almost a century, a man sue an invasive species. Oye, oye, court is in session, all rise. The Honorable Anna C. Forder presiding. In the rotunda of this historic building, there was a judge, a jury, a defense, and the plaintiff. My name is Dale Dufer. I'm an artist from St. Louis, and I'm bringing Bush Honey Suffolk to trial for the damages to the biodiversity of our native plants. The attorneys are real. That's a real judge. And Miss Henry, you may call your next witness. And the witnesses, like this gentleman from Forest Park Forever, are providing true and expert testimony. Um, it spreads um, quite easily, uh, mostly through seed. However, this is just a mock trial, and the verdict will have no legal standing. So why fake sue an invasive plant? Well, to understand why, you have to know honeysuckle. Bush honeysuckle was introduced to the United States from Asia in the early 1900s as ornamental wildlife cover. It seems like the perfect plant because it leafs out early in the spring, remains green in the late fall, grows quickly, tolerates drought, and provides natural privacy between neighbors. What's not to love, right? 
would some people say because oh it's a pretty plant that maybe you're beating up on it today because it's just a plant how is it going to defend itself but at the same time you you have to look at it you have to look at the issue well what makes bush honeysuckle so attractive is devastating to our natural habitats Here's the deal. Bush honeysuckle outperforms native plants. It grows so densely it shades out everything on the forest floor, limiting sunlight to native plants, often leaving nothing but bare soil, preventing forest regeneration. And if that's not bad enough, some research suggests that bush honeysuckle releases a toxin into the soil, making it really difficult for anything else to survive. And because of its red delicious berries, birds do what they do and spread bush honeysuckle around our region like wildfire. It's really good at what it does. It really knows how to pull us in and then kind of like go, okay, I, I, I've got this space. Uh, oh, now, oh, I've got I want that your space. space. Now I've got that space and then that space. There's a beautiful bush, great privacy hedge. But then I started to really look at it and go, wait a minute, it's, nothing else is growing. I don't have any baby trees coming up. You know, when we plant some other plant down there, it, it dies pretty quickly. So when we started removing it, what was left behind was essentially nothing. Dufer is not alone in his distaste for this shrub. There are conservationist groups all across Missouri who are concerned about the damaging effects bush honeysuckle has on our ecosystem. And the issue is even greater than what's happening in our backyard. Greenways in St. Louis are also referred to as trails. Kat Dockery is the executive director of the Open Space Council. She explains the importance of the riparian corridor the sacred space between our land and our waters. You know, the importance of riparian corridors is that it really allows some of the stormwater runoff that's coming to, to be stopped, to be soaked up before it goes directly into the river, which causes more, you know, erosion issues. It uh, brings a lot of, you know, the oils that, that are on the roads right into, um, right into our water. So it really acts as sort of a filter for the water uh, before it gets into the river. That's very important. The other thing, is uh, so our native plants have really been great for the riparian corridor because they, uh, you know, their their roots go so deep. Native plants have a significantly deeper root system than invasives, um, for the most part, and those plants allow the bank to really become stabilized. And we all know what honeysuckle does to those deep-rooted native plants, putting the health of our rivers and streams at risk. But the good news is, people like Dufer and groups like the Open Space Council and the Shaw Nature Reserve are working to eradicate bush honeysuckle from our parks and public spaces, saving our natural habitat. Meanwhile, back at the old courthouse... Closing argument. Ooh, honeysuckle! <laughs> Order in the court. Things were getting a little heated. Closing arguments were made, and the jury deliberated. Has the jury arrived at a verdict? Yes. Okay, thank you. The verdict is as follows. We, the jury, find in favor of the plaintiff and award the plaintiff a judgment in the following respects. Bush honeysuckle shall become classified as a noxious weed. Humans shall take action to eradicate bush honeysuckle in conjunction with sustained biodiversity restoration. We won! Now, of course, it's the responsibility for all of us to take action. Actions speak louder than words, and, you know, it's, it's a matter of, you know, being a responsible person. Well, there's no time for anything else, just digging up that honeysuckle. There's no time for anything else, just digging up that honeysuckle. It's been a hot summer, and while that might be uncomfortable in the big picture of the Earth's climate, extreme heat and drought is a global concern. But in some places, people aren't just talking about the weather, they're doing something about it. And one of those places is in St. Louis. 
I'm Ruthie Zell at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. Its mission is to improve the human condition through plant science. That is especially important at a time when crops are becoming increasingly vulnerable to extreme weather patterns. The work of one researcher aims to boost the resiliency of critical crops under those conditions. This is the, uh, what we call the panicle or the, the head covered in grain. Dr. Todd Mockler and his research team are studying the properties of sorghum. The cereal grain is, to say the least, diverse. They're looking at thousands of different lines that are genetic, they're all genetically different. And so we're trying to understand the genes that control traits like yield, for example. I'm particularly interested in understanding the genes and the gene networks that make one variety of sorghum or one variety of corn more drought tolerant than another, or drought resistant. Drought resistance is a big issue in the continent of Africa, where sorghum originated and where millions of farmers and their families rely on it for their very survival. Dr. Mockler travels to Sub-Saharan Africa as part of his research to identify genes and pathways responsible for sorghum's hardiness in spite of poor soil and semi-arid conditions. Uh, I usually, when I, I'm in, for example, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a, it's a dose of reality. You know, like we're very privileged here. Agriculture in the, in the West is extremely well developed and high tech and uh, a lot of the world, probably the majority of the world, don't don't benefit from those kind of technologies or, or get to uh, uh, take advantage of it. Corn, which is widely grown in the Americas, is genetically similar to sorghum. So Dr. Mockler is hopeful results of his research can eventually be applied to those crops. Other grains may benefit too. And what we have here, we have about a thousand different varieties of pearl millet. They're mostly from Africa, so Sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa. They're phenotypically very diverse. And so we, we're trying to, to understand what makes all these lines different, what makes one line maybe better for a particular trait than another, or worse. As the world population grows and climate patterns change, Dr. Mockler and his colleagues hope their research leads to higher crop yields for both food and biofuel. For example, liquid fuels. Um, for, for vehicles, so it could be ethanol or, or some future generation biofuel that could just go in the tank in a car. Uh, but there are other a uh, uh, aspects of bioenergy, so you could burn the biomass, for example, and make electricity. There, there are other components. Humans have been breeding crops for thousands of years, and they've always had to deal with the changing climate. Uh, what the, the real challenge that we're facing now is the accelerated pace of climate change. It was one of the summer's biggest events, the rededication of the Gateway Arch National Park. New name, new museum, new grounds, and some old issues. There was a ribbon cutting, then there was another ribbon cutting, and we'll get to that. It's all in the next story, along with Harry Truman, the politics of then and now, and what Eero Saarinen's daughter thinks about all of this. On behalf of my father and all the amazing made this possible, I opened the new park. Right. Earl Saarinen's daughter Susan was given the honor of cutting the ribbon July 3rd to open the redesigned and reinterpreted Museum of Westward Expansion. For the first time, visitors were entering through the new front door facing the city. Susan Saarinen had been here with her mother for the first dedication 50 years ago. Her father had passed away in 1961, before the arch was completed. This time, she brought her own family, although they did get a sneak peek the day before. This is a new experience for them, and my granddaughter was so excited last night going up the tram. Oh, yes! The dedications this year and in 68 opened the arch to the public, but they weren't the first ceremonies related to the National Park on the Riverfront. In 1939, Mayor Barney Dickman ceremoniously chipped out the first brick to kick off the demolition of the old buildings on the riverfront, clearing it for, well, at the time, they didn't know for what yet. After the war, they chose Eero Saarinen's arch, 
and President Harry Truman came in 1950 for a dedication. But it wasn't a ribbon cutting, it wasn't even a groundbreaking. In 1950, it was a very different story. People had seen what the arch would look like. There were drawings, there were plans. What they didn't know in 1950 was when or even if the arch was ever going to get built. President Harry Truman came to St. Louis in June of 1950 to attend the annual reunion of his World War I Army Division. But local officials saw this as an opportunity to give a shot in the arm to their plans to build a giant arch as a national monument. The riverfront had been cleared before the war, but it was now just a parking lot. I'm happy to participate in the dedication of this historic site to the memory of Thomas Jefferson and the early pioneers and settlers of our westward expansion. There was hope that if Congress would vote the money, the arch could be completed by 1953, the sesquicentennial of the Louisiana Purchase. It would be much longer than that, but the 1950s saw a city aggressively promoting itself and attacking its problems. After Harry Truman dedicated the site of the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial in 1950, he got down to the real business of his speech, the Soviet Union's threat to world peace, and America's resolve to stand up to that threat. Countries like the United States, which have responsibilities for maintaining peace and security outside the North Atlantic Treaty area, will, of course, continue to maintain whatever defense forces are needed to meet those responsibilities. Truman would have to back up his talk sooner than he thought. Two weeks later, North Korea invaded South Korea. 68 years later, the Korean situation continues to make headlines, and the 2018 rededication ceremony would also have political overtones, not international, but local. There were plenty of comments about the lack of diversity at the dedication, all white people at that ribbon cutting, even as the museum itself includes more diverse voices and a less heroic view of westward expansion. Three days later, African-American political leaders were holding what they called the people's ribbon cutting. If you look at the photos from last Tuesday and compare it to the one in 1965, it doesn't look any different. And in 2018, in 2018, that is unacceptable. The Gateway Arch Park Foundation apologized for the lack of diversity at the first event, and Susan Sarnan asked if she could take part in this one as well saying her father designed the arch to represent the brighter future he wanted to see. One, two, three. And as for all of the changes that have taken place, the hundreds of millions of dollars spent on the new museum, the grounds, the park bridging the highway, she likes what she sees. Everything that my father talked about as I was growing up was about context. An ashtray on a table, a table in a room, a room in a house, and a house in a city. And, and it's a beautifully done connection. This, this new entrance is so much more uh, embracing and beautiful it's very than welcoming. the original. Yeah. Yes, it is. I don't think it was an option in 1947 or 48, but I'm so glad it happened. And finally tonight, we want to brag a little bit. The Nine Network is stronger than ever before. In June, Nine improved the power of its signal by installing a new transmitter and upgrading to a larger antenna which has increased transmission power and improved reception capabilities. These upgrades were made to accommodate the change in broadcast frequency that was the result of last year's Federal Communications Commission's Spectrum Auction. The FCC uh, decided that they would take spectrum that was in the telecommunications spectrum and reallocate that for broadband use, basically internet, high-speed internet use. In order to accomplish that, they took back some of the spectrum 
that was owned and controlled by the broadcaster. The FCC held an auction where they bought Spectrum from interested broadcasters for a fee. Early on, the Nine Network decided to retain our Spectrum for future uses that are yet to come. But the FCC did buy a significant amount of Spectrum from other stations. And then that required them to move the channel position of many broadcasters down into a confined space to free up all of that spectrum space. And when we're moved off of our channel position into a new channel position, that's what's called repacking. Nine Network is one of the first television stations in the country and the first in the St. Louis region to repack its broadcast channel. These technology upgrades advances Nine's capability to bring new and creative services to viewers in the future. Next Generation Television has the potential to reshape how broadcasters relate to their audience, including on mobile devices, enhanced alerting, and better program guides. The broadcast signal is also more sustainable. The new transmitters operate off of different technology. They are more energy efficient, so we are able to achieve much higher power, which allows us to have broader reach into the community. And we can do that with a lower power consumption. So it really became a win-win situation. More power, more coverage, less power consumption. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. For Living St. Louis, I'm Anne Marie Berger. Funding for Living St. Louis is made possible through the Mary Rankin Jordan and Eddie A. Jordan Charitable Foundation and through the generous support of the members of KETC.